Good evening. Hope you all are doing well. And uh, we're going to forego our opening song tonight. Um, my wife's in the nursery with the kids. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and get into our Bible study. So let's go ahead and uh, bow together for a word of prayer. And then we will turn together to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So let's bow for prayer, please. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a local church. Thank you for each person who's here tonight. Help us as we dig into the text in front of us that we would really understand it well. Um, help me to communicate this passage effectively. Um, I know it's a really practical topic. It's something that uh, we will all need at some point. And uh, maybe tonight there are people that will really need to hear these things. And so I pray that you'll really use your word to minister to our hearts and to strengthen us and challenge us in your word today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you could take your Bibles, let's look together at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and the section we're looking at is verses 11 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage, and then we're going to give a little bit of a background review from last week, and then continue in our study, part 2. And the topic we're dealing with is persevering in ministry. Persevering in ministry. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11 says this, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep the commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in this time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, I want to remind you, last week, when we looked at this passage of Scripture, we saw that the main point is this. The section of the letter warned Timothy to keep his priorities focused on Christ and eternity rather than the kinds of things that were causing false teachers to drift from the simplicity of the gospel. One of the things that we talked about last week is that ministry is a tough thing to be involved in. Now, I'm not saying that because I want you to think that ministry is miserable. Actually, ministry is a wonderful thing to be involved in. But we need to recognize that ministry has a very difficult, difficult side to it. In fact, in the midst of the wonderful blessings that we experience when we're involved in ministry, we often experience at the very same time some of the great challenges of ministry. So you could have a situation where you're going through a season of tremendous blessing and at the exact same time go through some challenges that really knock you down. Or you may be going through a season and discouraging and in the midst of those discouragements, God gives you some blessings. So we need to understand that there's this mixed bag and in order for someone to be faithful in ministry, there are certain things that have to be a, a part of their thinking and a part of really their worldview and how they're going to live their lives. So the first thing we saw is this, persevering in ministry means fleeing from dangerous distractions. There are things that can draw our attention away from the gospel, away from eternity, away from what's most important, and Paul addresses those very issues. I won't go back over that, but I want to remind you that there are things that we must turn away from that are going to distract us from being faithful. The second fact we saw is that persevering in ministry means pursuing godliness. So he's not just talking about negatively turn away from these things, but positively turn towards certain things. In other words, ministry is not just turning away from distraction, it's turning toward God and being absorbed in what he has for us. The third fact that we saw, persevering in ministry means being willing to suffer in pursuit of the prize. In fact, I really love the way that he puts it. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 
And when we talked about that word fight, the Greek word that's used there, translated fight here, is the word agonizomai. And we know that when we hear that word, we recognize that there is a transliteration there. The idea is to agonize in a struggle. It's like you have someone who's in a competition. They're in a battle. They're in a boxing match. They're in a wrestling match. They're running a race. And the reality is, in the midst of that struggle, they're bearing under this heavy load, this weight, this pressure. And so what does he say? He says, in the midst of the battle, you need to continue pressing on. He doesn't just say agonize, but the idea is you're supposed to lay hold of eternal life. You're to grab a hold of this and grip it and not let it go. It's all about priorities. It's all about emphasizing and living for what really matters, what's most important. And so if we're going to persevere in ministry, if we're going to be faithful, and by the way, whenever I talk to somebody about ministry, particularly someone who's younger, I never want to discourage them from going into ministry, but I also don't want to give them the false impression that it's easy. And so I want people to realize there's a balance. When I think about being a missionary, and we went to a foreign field, the reality is there are things about living in Ghana, working in a cross-cultural context, that they're some of the sweetest memories of my entire life. Some of the most incredible blessings that I've ever experienced. Some of the, the highest mountains of joy I found in that labor. And I will also tell you, at the same time, some of the darkest, most discouraging and frustrating moments of my entire life were very close to those great joys. And the reality is that there are times that the distractions can overwhelm us. And so we have to have balance when we look at this. So let's move from those first three and let's move into part four or part two. Fact number four, persevering in ministry means keeping the presence of Christ constantly in your mind. Now this is a really, really important statement that we need to keep in our minds. In fact, it's interesting. I think about what Paul says to those who are working under a master. And one of the things that Paul says is, he says, do your work as unto the Lord and not unto men, realizing that from the Lord you will receive the crown. He says, do your work not as men pleasers, but as those who fear God. One of the things that the scriptures emphasize over and over and over again is that the way that people are faithful is by not thinking about the person who's looking over their shoulder, but thinking about the one who's in heaven watching everything they do. He sees their motives. He sees the good and the bad. He looks at it truly objectively. And so the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, if you're going to be faithful, you've got to keep God's presence in the forefront of your mind. And that has to drive you to be a faithful man. In verse 13, he puts it this way. I give thee charge. It's a really important word. I'm going to talk about it in a second. In the sight of who? In the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good profession. I want us to break down each of these phrases, and I want us to think about these things for just a moment. The first is this. He received a solemn duty. He says, I give thee charge. You know, one of the things that's so important in life, and I want you to think about it in, in the idea of any kind of ministry that you have. And when you think ministry, don't think just of, oh, the pastor is the one who has a ministry, and everybody else, well, they're not ministering. That's not true. The truth is, if you're saved, if you're a part of the local church, you have a ministry of some kind. The ministry might be dad, it might be mom, it might be Sunday school teacher, it might be neighbor, it might be co-worker, but you have a ministry. And so don't just think in the, the standpoint of somebody who's missions, church planting, pastoring, evangelist, think Ministry is whatever God has given me as my position to actually influence people for the sake of God's kingdom. He says, I give you a charge, Timothy. A charge. You know, I think about sometimes when I was, I, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I can remember it was like, it was like a point in my life where my dad was like, I'm going to look at you now as a man. And I'm not just looking at you as a little boy or as a young man who's growing, but I'm going to look at you as a man. 
okay? You're going to be going out into the world, and you're going to have to be responsible. And I remember him sitting me down and saying, this is what you've got to do, challenged me, okay? This is kind of the idea. It's like you're sitting your son down. You're sitting your child down who you've seen that they've gone to that point in life where now they're ready to be a responsible adult. And you say, it's time for you to take charge. And I'm giving you this solemn, solemn duty. That's what, that's what he's basically doing with Timothy. He's saying, I'm giving you a responsibility. And this responsibility is not just between me and you or you and the people that get to witness this conversation. It's between you and God. The solemn duty is in God's presence. He says, I give it to you in the sight of God. And I want to remind you of something. We have all been given some sacred duty by God. Every single one of us. And you know, sometimes we overlook those duties. There's a little book in our bookstore. It's called Ordinary. I've mentioned it a few times, I know. And what I love about this book is it emphasizes the fact that being faithful as a Christian is really about just living the Christian life vibrantly in whatever place God puts you. It means just being faithful in your daily tasks. And one of the things that this, uh, that this author really emphasizes, he says, you know, it's so much easier to go to a place like a, a faraway country where there's a lot of poverty and a lot of neediness, and you go there and you, maybe you give clothes to somebody, you work in a soup kitchen, you do something that really makes you feel good. He said it's so much easier to do that than it is to love your next door neighbor. It's true. To love your spouse, to love your kids, to love your parents, to love your brother, sister, and the Lord in the church. He said that, though, is really the heart and soul of being a vibrant Christian. And so God has given us all duties. And one of the things that we have to remember is that his presence is always with us. Now, that, that concept of God's presence being with us can be looked at a lot of different ways. One way, it can, it can kind of cause you to be a little bit afraid, okay? So if you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, and you're reminded, God's watching, that's something that's going to kind of rein you in a little bit. And particularly, when, you know, when you're a teenager or a young person, that's the way you tend to think of it. God's going to rein me in because of his presence there. But then you think about when you go through a really tough time, a hardship, you experience the death of a family member. You go through something that you just can't make sense of. And all of a sudden, God's presence isn't about causing you to be afraid and rein you in, but God's presence is about comforting you. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? And then there are times where you feel like you have a task that is too great for you to do. You don't know how you can actually follow through with something. And you say, I don't know if I can do this. And God's presence is there to say, you can. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you what you need. It's like when Joshua was reminded to be strong in the Lord. That's the idea. His presence is always with us. I want to remind you, he's aware of our struggles. There's no Christian in this room that doesn't have struggles. None. None. I don't know what your week was like. You know, we all walk in here, we all look like we got everything together. But we might not. <laughs> it might be that on the way here, like every Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you this, my kids, when they get in that car and we drive, it's like, we're playing the quiet game. Why? Because we need sanity, okay? So there's been like constant noise in the house all day. And it's like the one time my wife and I get to talk while we're driving to church. It's like, da, 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 on and on and on and on. You know what I'm talking about? Well, the reality is that that can get to you. That constant noise, that constant going on and on and on. But there might be something that you're carrying that's very, very heavy. And you don't share with anybody. But the reality is God's aware of that. And his presence is something that is going to do what? It's going to strengthen you and help you in that moment. He sees our quiet service behind the scenes. That's really important. You know, the truth is that there are times that people, some of the, some of the most noble things that Christians do are not seen by the people around them. It's true. And some of the things that people really talk about, like, hey, did you see what they did? That's the thing that's like, well, they had the reward, <laughs> okay? Sometimes that's the way it works. Yet God sees those little things. And God comes alongside of us and he strengthens us. 
And the reality is if we're going to be faithful in the ministries that God's called us to, we have to have this constant sense of God's presence. And so Paul tells Timothy, I charge thee in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things before Christ Jesus, before whom Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. And by the way, we're going to get into this, this very interesting thing that he kind of alludes to in just a moment. But I want to remind you, don't forget about God's presence in your life. That's a huge comfort. It's something we desperately need to be reminded of. Fifth, persevering in ministry means following the example of Christ. Here's how he puts it in verse 13. He says, Who, before Pontius Pilate, witnessed a good confession. Now, I don't know how many of you remember back to when we were going through sermons related to the Passion Week. Does anybody remember that? This seems like an eternity ago, but believe it or not, this was right before we had COVID, all right? Actually, it was like at the beginning of the COVID time. So we were not able to have like our normal Resurrection Sunday where we have, you know, our choir sing and special music and and like a cantata that's focusing on the death of Christ and the resurrection and all those things. But what we did do is we had five sermons that were focused on the progression of the final week of Christ's ministry before the cross and before the empty tomb. And I remember one of the things that we focused on, in fact, if you want to go back, you go back to YouTube or go back to Facebook, you can see these sermons. But we talked about Christ when he was standing before Pontius Pilate. And the thing that really stood out to me when I was studying that passage was that Jesus was standing before a man who was supposed to be in the position of justice. And he knows Christ is innocent. He absolutely knows it. In fact, he says, I know that you're an innocent man. He knows it. His wife even comes to him and says, you better be careful how you handle that man. Because I've had terrible dreams about what's going on, and it's about him. You better be careful what you do with that man. Yet what does Jesus experience before Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate, he, he clearly, knowing what he's doing, he says, you know what, I'm going to please the crowd, and I'm going to crucify an innocent man. And to kind of like balm my conscience, I'm going to wash my hands, and I'm going to say it was all your fault. Like, It's a shocking display of injustice. It's absolutely incredible that this happened the way that it did. Yet what do we see when Christ is standing before him? We see humility. This is the creator of the universe standing before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate says, don't you know who I am? And he says, do you know who I am? Like, I made the world? Like, if I didn't give you authority, you couldn't do what you're about to do. That's the way Jesus is handling this man. Yet what do we see? Incredible humility. We see temperance. Rather than Christ smashing this guy, he realizes that he came into the world for this purpose, to go to the cross. And so experiencing this injustice, what does Christ do? He's humble, he's meek, he's temperate. There's a sacrificial love that Christ has. He's willing to lay down his own life so that we can be redeemed. If Christ was unwilling to do that, we wouldn't have salvation, folks. If it wasn't for the cross, there'd be zero redemption and zero hope of redemption. And so we see that Christ goes to the cross sacrificially. He completely releases his rights and he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. You say, why are you emphasizing this? Because this is what Paul says to Timothy. Remember, I charge you before Christ, who stood before Pontius Pilate and witnessed a good confession. And when he's talking to Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, do you realize there might be some people in your congregation that are going to hate you and despise you? I mean, after all, if he's going to somebody who's not supposed to be a pastor anymore, shouldn't be teaching anymore because they're a false teacher, and he says, we have to have one form of doctrine, sound doctrine, you can't teach this anymore, and he's got to face that kind of wrath. Don't you think people are going to talk about the guy? They're going to try to bully him and back him into a corner. And he's going to really go through a lot of difficulty. Yet he says, don't forget Christ. He stood there. He knew what was going on. And he was strong. 
And Timothy, that's your example. That's what he's saying. In fact, in Ephesians 5, 1, Paul writes, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice unto God for a sweet-smelling savor. The Apostle Paul is emphasizing that ministry involves following the example of the humility of Christ. That's really huge. In 1 John 2, verses 5-3, another text we've, we've covered in the last, I don't know, two, three years or something. He says, Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Now, I remember dealing with this passage and asking the question, how is it that John is telling those Christians that I'm writing you no new commandment, but, oh, by the way, I'm writing you a new commandment? And I go, what in the world is he talking about? Like, this this doesn't make sense. He has a new commandment, he doesn't. Which one is it? And he says, it's both. It's both. I expect you to follow Christ's example. Which, by the way, if you follow Christ's example, means you're going to walk in a righteous and consistently obedient fashion. Why? Because you're doing what he did. The righteous one obeyed the law. He fulfilled the law. And when you follow him, you know what you're doing? You're doing what he did. And by the way, that's no different than your expectation even under the old system. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so essentially what John's saying is, what I'm telling you to do is not any different in principle than it was under the old system. In the, New, in the Old Testament, it's really not any different. It's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Obey God. But instead of your focus being on the law, your focus is on the example of Christ. And as you focus on the example of Christ, and as you follow in Christ's steps, you will be doing that. It's amazing to think about. And that's what he's saying. Ministry, faithfulness in ministry, involves following Christ's example. And so there are times in ministry, whatever ministry you're in, where you're going to have to sit down and say, you know what, I'm going to have to take one for the team here. <laughs> when I say take one for the team, what I mean is I'm going to have to swallow my pride, I'm going to have to be humble, I have to release my rights. I have to love my neighbor like I love myself. I'm going to do what Christ did. By the way, nobody here is going to a cross. Nobody is, but he did. And so we haven't reached his level yet, okay? We're talking about an absolutely high and perfect standard. We then come to a sixth fact. Look at my time. Good, we're moving well here. Persevering in ministry means living with an awareness of the judgment seat of Christ. But this is interesting. We've emphasized that we're recognizing that we are always with God and He is with us. And His presence is there. That's really important. Then we're emphasizing the fact that we're to follow His example. Thirdly, or sixth if we're looking at part two here, we're to persevere in ministry living with an awareness of the judgment seat of Christ. The idea is that we know there's going to be a day of reckoning or we know that there's going to be a day of rejoicing. And it really comes down to what we do with the time between now and then. Now what's really interesting is when Paul talks about the judgment seat, he's actually alluding to something that was very, very well known in their culture. Now, you know, in our culture we love sports, we love football, we love a lot of sports, and we, you know, we just had the World Series. The, the, the last time the Dodgers won the World Series, I was a kid. I remember Kirk Gibson hitting a home run, hobbling around, yeah, you know, hobbling around the bases. I think that's the last time the Dodgers won. You know, we love sports. I want you to realize something. We don't love sports in our culture like they did in the ancient world. We don't. Believe it or not, we don't. And the crowning moment of an athlete's life 
was when they stood before the emperor at the Bema seat, and they received this laurel wreath, and it was placed on their head. And it was a demonstration that they were being crowned victorious in whatever the competition was that they competed. Wrestling, boxing, running, field events, being crowned. It was the height, the pinnacle of honors in the ancient world. But in order to be crowned, you had to run well. You had to run by the rules. You had to compete in a way that was consistent with the rules that were there. And by the way, lots of competitors, but only one is crowned. What's really interesting is that Paul uses that as the illustration of what will take place when we as Christians stand before Christ. Now, we're not running races against each other. We are running races that he's assigned to us, and he's looking at whether or not we're faithful with the race that's set before us. In other words, it's not about how I do compared to Scott. It's about how Scott did compared to what God expected of Scott. It's about how Pastor Joel did according to what he was expected to have of, of, of the Lord. And that would be the same for each of us. But notice the way he puts it in verse 14. He says that you're to do this until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's reminding us, and specifically Timothy here, of the reality of the judgment seat of Christ. He's calling us to focus on it, not the temporary noise of living in a fallen world and ministering to fallen people. And when I talk about the temporary noise, the idea is that there are a lot of things that happen on a day-by-day -day basis. Some of them are really good and we get you know, really excited about it. Some of them are very difficult and we get very discouraged about it. The reality is, you know, if you want to and know what it's like to you know, be a yo-yo, then go into ministry, okay? There's really good days, there's really bad days, and sometimes there's good and bad on the same day. He says, but that's noise. That's noise. That's not really the main point. He says, so you need to focus on the day you're going to stand before Christ. We as Christians need to all do that. In fact, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul has a lot to say about the Bema seat. This is not the great white throne. This is the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, that really was pictured by what they experienced in the games when someone was crowned by the ruler. He says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the ministry of mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yeah, judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified. He that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Now, I want you to realize that this passage is probably worth a couple of sermons, just to be very honest. Because there are so many important details. And I also want you to realize kind of the setting of why Paul makes these statements. I want you to realize that when Paul writes these things, he's writing to a church that he probably invested physically, personally, and more than any other church in the New Testament that we read about. He spent probably close to two years at Corinth. He loved the people at Corinth. He was involved in really the planting of the church at Corinth. We know that he wrote at least three letters to the church at Corinth. Yet Paul was having a bittersweet kind of relationship with these people. He loved them dearly, but they didn't like his authoritative apostolic approach, where he's holding them accountable to what is true and what is right. And so he had people in the congregation that were really trying to undermine his authority as an apostle. And this is really interesting. The first thing he says is, let us so account. In other words, this is how you need to look at what I'm doing, because this is how I look at it. He says, we're ministers of Christ. Do I serve you in some way? Yes. But whether it's you or whether it's someone else, I'm ultimately serving somebody higher, and that's him. I'm a servant of Christ. 
So don't actually answer to you. That's what he's saying. I answer to him. Not, not that he is totally calloused and he doesn't care what the people at Corinth think about him, that he has like no care at all. He's not saying that, but he's saying really what consumes me and drives me, what really matters to me is what he thinks. That's what he's saying. He says, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, God has entrusted to me certain things that I'm supposed to communicate to you. And I take that very, high, very seriously. It is, a, it, is a, it is a very important responsibility that I don't take lightly. He says it's required that stewards are found faithful. He's like, I just want to do what God made me to do. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to do what's right. That's what he's saying. He says it's a small thing to be judged of you. Can you imagine a pastor who's in conflict with his congregation saying to the congregation, you know, it doesn't really matter to me what you think. I like, I think about it, like, that's kind of like, whoa, that seems a little arrogant, does it not? But honestly, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, I'm concerned about what God thinks. And so if you think I'm wrong, okay, that's okay, but it's not the end of the world. If you think that I'm doing right and I'm really not, then what you think is not really a big deal. That's what he's saying. He said, but this is interesting. He says, I judge not my own self. He says, I'm not even so convinced that I'm right in what I'm doing, that I say, you know what, the way that God views me is the same way I view myself. Do you understand what he's saying? In other words, it's like a person who, who you say, are you being faithful in your, in your ministry? And they say, absolutely, I am. But you know, God's the ultimate judge. It's like, I believe that I'm doing the right thing, but he's the one that really is taking a look at this. That's, that's what he's saying. So really, Paul's not being arrogant. He's actually being pretty humble because he recognizes even how I perceive my own ministry is not, it's not the standard, it's what God thinks. He says, I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. In other words, in my conscience, I believe I'm doing the right thing. But that doesn't mean I'm right. He says, judge nothing before the time. God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. God will manifest the counsels of the heart. He says, on that day, God is going to go down into the depths of not just what I did, but why I did it. You know, this is huge. There are so many times in life that we do the right thing and people, they doubt us. On the other side, frankly speaking, there are times that we do the right thing for the wrong reason and everybody thinks we've done well. And the the fact is, God knows. We may not even realize it at the time. We may think that our motives are pure. And Paul's saying, really, it comes down to what God sees. He's going to draw out my true motivation for what I've done. And you know who I'm concerned about? It's praise from God. Now, I want you to realize something. If you will do the ministry work that God calls you to with this mindset, it will free you up in a way you cannot imagine okay? It's not that you're callous to how people view you, okay? I don't think that's a healthy thing. It's not a healthy thing for a pastor or a missionary or whatever capacity you're ministering. Go, I could care less what you think. That's not what we're talking about. But what is also not healthy is when someone who is leading and someone who is serving, frankly, is completely consumed with perception. It's about what they think people think of them, I want to tell you, if you want to be a slave in life, then be a slave to your fears of how people see you. And the reality is that what you think people think of you might be very wrong in the positive or in the negative. It's true. The Apostle Paul is saying, I can say this with clear conscience. My service is to Christ alone. And that is what drives me and that's what consumes me. And when I stand before him, I want him to look at me and say, Paul, not only did you do what was right, but you did it for the right reason. And here is your reward for faithfulness. That's what Paul wants. And that's what he wants of us. And that's what I hope that we have. We have a final fact that I'll mention very quickly here. But this is not the least of importance, I promise you. Persevering in ministry means living with a passion for God's glory. I will tell you what robs people in ministry of joy. 
it's when they're really serving for their own, their own glory. Because here's the truth. When you do that, you will be a yo-yo. <laughs> you will be a yo-yo. Because when people recognize what you're doing, your head's going to be this big. And when people don't see what you're doing, or they don't appreciate what you're doing, or they misconstrue what you're doing, or they actually really do not like what you're doing, you will be as down low as possible. And let me tell you, that's a horrible way to live. It's a horrible way to live. Yeah, I think that's how so many people live. But you know, when it's all about God's glory, whether people appreciate it or not, he got glorified. You know, even when the Apostle Paul talks about people who are preaching the gospel in spite because they wanted to hurt him personally, and that's shocking. He says, you know what? I'm not saying it's good, but I'm glad that God's using it in spite of what they're doing. That's pretty amazing to think about. Yeah, I know that that pastor is not doing it the right way, but God even allows a stopped clock to tell the time right twice a day, and I'm glad when it does. <laughs> that's what he's saying. Folks, we need to live for God's glory. It needs to be about Him, not about us. And that's a really hard place for us to stay in. In fact, one of the reasons I think God lets us suffer sometimes, sometimes the reason that He lets us go through seasons that are very lean and difficult, is because He wants us to get back to the basics where we realize it's not about us, it's about Him. And sometimes that is the most gracious thing He could do, is let us go through hardship. He says, in times past, in his times, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings, the lord of lords, who only hath immora- immort- <laughs> not immorality, immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Paul is reflecting on the reality of his ministry, and this just causes him to erupt into praise to God. He says, there's no king like him, there's no Lord like him. He is immortal. No one can approach him, honor and power are in his presence forever. And he says, that's what drives me, Timothy, and that's what has to drive you. The Christian life is full of struggles, folks. Challenges are going to happen. It's a reality. Yet God has provided in Christ all the tools that we need to faithfully persevere in the ministries he's called us to. And so I want to remind you of these simple facts one more time, very quickly. Number one, persevering in ministry means fleeing from dangerous distractions. Two, pursuing godliness. Three, being willing to suffer in pursuit of the prize. Four, keeping the presence of Christ constantly in your mind. Five, following the example of Christ. Six, living with an awareness of the judgment seat of Christ. And lastly, persevering in ministry means living with a passion for God's glory, not our own glory. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do this. This is very simple, very hard. (laughs) Very simple, very hard. Let's bow together and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for allowing us to look into this passage tonight. I don't know where people are in their challenges. Could be that there are folks in here going through a wonderful, wonderful, encouraging time in life, and I'm so thankful for that. Help them to enjoy those blessings, but I pray that they would keep things in perspective. Could be that there are people here tonight that are going through great, great valleys and frustrations and difficulties. And I pray that you would sustain them through that. Father, whatever capacity you call us to, where we have a position of service in your your wonderful plan of bringing people to yourself, I pray that we would do our work heartily unto you and not unto men. Take these words and use them to really help us this evening in Christ's name. Amen.